In the name of the one true and living God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. It was not an invitation to a backyard barbecue, nor to an impromptu potluck, nor to just any banquet. Preparations for the celebration of a lifetime were underway. It, the occasion was the royal wedding of the king's son. Now, in the normal course of events, who in their right mind would refuse such a generous imperial invitation? And who, having accepted the invitation, would deign to be the least bit presumptuous or insolent in such a setting? Nobody, I would think, except it seems for the people in this parable. These folk invited by the king to share in what would doubtlessly be the grandest celebration ever somehow, somehow chose to snub the royal summons and reject the authority and respect due to the monarch. Now, having said that, I would be the first to admit that in our modern Western culture, we tend to think of invitations as optional for the most part. It depends on what's on my calendar. And then, of course, the notion of being invited to a royal wedding, well, that's another story entirely. <laughs> so that's not for us, but let's consider the context of Jesus' parable. Our Lord is in the holy city, Jerusalem. He's actually within the temple precincts itself, speaking to a multitude of persons, among them religious leaders, chief priests and elders, persons all well-educated in the faith. And all to a person, they are sharing one commonly held notion of kingship, that of their Lord and God. Avinu Malkainu, our Father, our King. These words are the opening words of each verse of the Jewish litany of supplication that they these chief priests, elders of the people, would lead in the liturgy. They would pray it with special devotion during the ten days of penitence at the beginning of each religious year. They knew it well. They knew the significance. Our Father, our King, we have no king other than you, our Father, our King, for your sake, have mercy on us. That's the prayer. And then again, the book of Psalms, the Tehillim, also frequently made this clear. For example, at Psalm 74, we read, God is my King from ancient times, working salvation in the midst of the earth. And again, at Psalm 145, I will exalt you, my God, my King, and I will bless your name forever and ever. In fact, Psalms 93, 94, 95, 96, 97, 98, 99 are all known, well-known royal psalms. They all acknowledge and celebrate God as King. So when Jesus was speaking there in the temple to these religious leaders about the king, they knew whom he was alluding to. He was directing their attention to none other than the Holy One of Israel, who resided not only in his temple there on Zion's hill, but also reigned as king over Israel and of the whole world. In the words of the 103rd Psalm, he it is who has established his throne in the heavens and whose kingdom rules over all. They knew it well. 
Sadly, though, Matthew tells us that this parable was the final one in a set of three teaching parables. And they were actually Jesus' response to the temple leaders' questioning of his authority to heal, to touch, and to, to teach. Now, if they knew that Jesus was the son of the king, they've seen his marvelous works. If they knew that the king was their Lord and God, then they should be among those religious leaders in Jerusalem, praise and rejoicing over Jesus, just as the multitudes proclaimed him, not only as he entered the city, but also as he healed the blind and the lame and was teaching and re-establishing a palpable aura of sanctity in that holy place. But that was not the case, was it? When these religious leaders saw the amazing things that Jesus did, they became angry, and they began plotting in earnest, trying desperately to find something that they could use against Jesus to discredit him. But then, O oh Lord, in his grace, use this new image, that of the wedding banquet, to illustrate the current state of religious environment that was theirs, so that they would hear it alongside the previous two vineyard parables that he already shared. The first, of course, remember, the two sons, and then the next was the wicked stewards. Now, could they miss calling to mind the images of the people of Israel being invited to a great feast, a feast provided and prepared by God for his chosen. For example, as recounted by the prophet Isaiah, on this mountain, mountain of Zion, the Lord of hosts will make for all peoples a feast of rich food, a feast of well-aged wines, of rich food filled with marrow of well-aged wines strained clear. Perhaps they missed it. That may very well have been the case. Let's take a look. As we've heard, Jesus' allegorical description of the kingdom of heaven related to them and to us once more, the elaborate preparations are complete for the marriage feast of the king's son, and the invitations have been sent out. What happens? There comes the first shock. Some invitees rejected the royal invitation outright. Bless you. Jesus says that some people simply refused to come. Others paid no attention. They were dismissive, to put it politely. They chose instead to focus on their own means of prospering themselves. Nevertheless, the king was not about to give up. He sent more servants out this time, detailing how incredible the festivities would be. How do we see this? Well, by repeating his invitation, the king is demonstrating his grace, his compassion to these folks is longing to share the hospitality of his kingdom with them. But here again, the invitees seem not to want anything to do with that salvific reconciliation that the king is offering to them and which he was anticipating that they would accept. They seemingly couldn't care less about that. So yet again, they delivered another disappointing response. This time, though, some even abused the messengers whom the king had sent with his word of blessing. Another group killed the king's messengers, even as they were delivering the royal invitations. Jesus says such responses made it clear that these people were not worthy. And ultimately, the invitation was extended on the wider horizon of universality to all people. But yet, here again, a glitch surfaces. Considering the fate of the inappropriately dressed would-be participant 
in the heavenly feast, accepting the invitation does not mean being able to dictate one's own terms and conditions for going into the presence of the king. The king who showed up inappropriately dressed didn't deserve to stay, and so both scenarios end badly. That's the parable. So what are we to make of it? Now, the metaphorical language of this parable places before us some very literal truths, no escaping them. And to be honest, it does so with startling intensity. Truths that are meant to shock us into our spiritual senses. First of all, they remind us that we may not make light of the invitation to respond to God's call. And secondly, the need to accept the free gift of grace presented is not an option. We don't insist on adopting an attitude of self-justification or self-righteousness as we enter into God's presence. Here is how the Apostle Paul presented this awareness to the early Christian community in Galatia, that's modern Turkey. Paul writes, as many of you as were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. And he further spelled out the specifics in his letter to the Colossians as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience. That was the clear understanding among the broad spectrums of people forming the early church, both in the cultured Greek communities such as Colossae, as well as the fiercely heroic, spontaneous Celtic Gentile communities of Galatia. But this was not a new concept. This was well known also within the ancient faith of Judaism. The chief priests and the religious leaders at the temple that day were also well familiar with the words of the prophet Isaiah when he proclaimed his exuberance for the attire that is provided by the Lord their God for his faithful as they would come into his presence. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and enter his courts with praise. But I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall be joyful in my God for he has clothed me. He has clothed me with the garments of salvation. He's covered me with the robe of righteousness. As a bridegroom decks himself with ornaments and as a bride adorns herself with her jewels. That's what they knew. Can we ourselves hear this as applicable to us also? God's generous invitation to its faith and faithful living is extended to us. And all it asks from us is a fully committed heart and response. That's it. However, at the conclusion of the parable, Jesus put it this way. Somewhat sadly, many are called, but few are chosen. And would you know it? The truth of Jesus' words is so evident in other gospel examples. On the one hand, a merchant sold everything to buy the pearl of great price. On another, a rich young ruler, remember? He refused Jesus' invitation to follow him and went away sadly. What about each of us? We have received and we have responded. Here we are to the invitation of our God and King. And we have come as guests of our God and King to share in the sacred marriage supper of His Son, Jesus Christ. So here's the question. Are we appropriately attired spiritually? St. Paul, the apostle, warned the Corinthians that whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord unworthily will have to answer for the body and blood of the Lord. So, with what spirit do we come into his presence? 
Have we accepted, each of us, have we accepted and clothed ourselves with the sanctifying grace and love that he offers? And more importantly, when we leave this place, what will be the garment with which we clothe ourselves? That's important too. Will each of us be among the chosen? That is my prayer for each and every one of us. May it be so. May we always approach this holy mystery with due reverence and awe and love for the Holy One of God, our Lord Jesus Christ, who is in our midst, here, in our midst, and who comes to abide with us, to dwell with us, within us, making us holy as he himself is holy. Do I hear an amen?